All right, so good morning, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And of course, there are no classrooms right now. All of you are stuck at home, so we still appreciate our live teachers, live families, and tons of groups joining in on YouTube today for tuning in as we continue to highlight amazing scientists, explorers, and facilities across the globe. Today, we continue with one of our longest standing partners from the very get-go. I think he might have done our first session or something. George Brunus is joining live in Toronto, and he is one of the world's foremost adventurers and explorers. He is the Canadian chair of the Explorers Club. He is an explorer in residence for the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. He has been to every continent on this planet multiple times in pursuit of volcanoes, hurricanes, tornadoes, all sorts of amazing natural phenomena. And even though he's done a ton of sessions with us, he has never done a session on this topic. So today, we are going to explore thunderbolts and lightning and all sorts of very, very cool things. We're going to learn a whole bunch about it uh, and see some of the cool places he has gone around the world in pursuit of our most shocking natural phenomena. Without further ado, thank you so, so much for joining us, George, and take us away. I uh, love the uh, lightning puns you got there and, and the queen quote, of course. <laughs> lightning, very, very frightening. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Um, my name is George Garudis, and I'm a storm chaser, explorer, and uh, TV host. And I'd spent a lot of time traveling around the world documenting extreme forces of nature. So tornadoes, hurricanes, volcanoes. But one of the first natural phenomena that I was really excited about was lightning, because we've all seen it. You don't have to travel to some obscure part of the world to, to go see it. You can, most people, are very familiar with it. So what I've got for you guys today is some uh, tales of my, some of my lightning encounters in some parts of the world and a whole bunch of really weird facts and really interesting things about lightning that you may not have ever heard of before. So I really wanted to explore the weird side of lightning and it gets super weird. So here we go. Let me uh, get the screen sharing going here. And there we are. Cool, awesome. So um, I first started photographing lightning and trying to document it back in 1997. So over 20 years now. And interestingly, um, I don't control lightning like Thor can, of course. If I could summon lightning, like like he can, then boy, my life would be a whole lot different. So what I do is the next best thing is I try to go where the lightning is or try and set up where I think lightning is going to be happening. So these bolts of electricity from the sky are as beautiful and fascinating as they are, well, dangerous and can be deadly, of course. So it's, it is a danger being out there, especially when I'm out in the field with a metal tripod. I'm not uh, uh, that protected by the lightning. So, but I will tell you some safety uh, precautions that you can take uh, a little bit later in the presentation. So when I'm out in the field, when I'm chasing tornadoes, uh, things like that, lightning is always a byproduct of the storms that I'm chasing. So I always take the opportunity to try and find a beautiful landscape, sometimes a flat field with beautiful, uh, I'm not sure this is corn, I mean, that's not corn, wheat or, or canola, whatever that is, but beautiful uh, lightning. This was in Kansas. Uh, but my home is here in Toronto, Canada. And here in the city, we have the CN Tower, which is one of the tallest buildings in the world. And we know that lightning likes to hit tall objects. It doesn't always hit the tallest object around, but it likes to hit really tall things. And of course, the CN Tower, as you can see, it sticks out uh, amongst the rest of the buildings in Toronto. So it gets hit between 70 to 100 times per year. And that was my introduction to trying to document this, this phenomenon because I had this beautiful, perfect lightning rod so close to home. And I used to ride my bicycle in the pouring rain down from my apartment to the waterfront where I could set up my tripod and try and get these photos. And you think normally lightning comes down from the cloud and strikes the ground. Well, yes, that's true. But sometimes you actually get lightning that's generated from the ground and goes up into the storm. And that's exactly what happened here. These bolts are not coming from the sky down to the tower. They're actually going up. And I've got a little video example here from, I believe it's a tower in Australia. Check this out. You can see how the lightning branches up out of 
the uh, the building into the clouds. So this this is a, a very interesting phenomenon. It's we like to call it reverse lightning because the polarity. Think of of a storm cloud as kind of like a battery. You've got a positive and a negative terminal, and these lightning bolts are basically short circuits between those positive and negative poles. And sometimes that spark gets generated from the cloud down to the ground. Sometimes the sparks stay in the clouds and sometimes they come up from the ground into the cloud. So it's really fascinating the way this works. But, but basically, lightning is nothing more than a static electric spark. If you've ever rubbed your feet across the carpet and touched uh, your sister's ear or your brother's nose, or if you've been petting a cat, sometimes you can build up a static electricity charge. If you're petting your cat and then touch it on the wet nose, you'll get a little zap. Or if you rub a balloon against your hair and then stick it to the wall, those are all examples of static electricity, but on a much, much smaller scale, right? And that static electricity can also make your hair stand up. So if you go to a science museum, like a science center, we've got one here in Toronto, the Ontario Science Center, but they're all over North America. A lot of them have these devices called a uh, Van de Graaff generator. And what you do is you stand on a rubber mat and put your hand on this ball and that static electricity builds up in your body and it causes your hair to stand on end, which is really, really cool. But you don't wanna ever experience that if you're outside. If you're in a storm and your hair starts to stand up, that means that the electrical charge is starting to build up in your area. And a lightning bolt is likely gonna hit something nearby, maybe a tree, maybe a fence post, maybe the top of your head. So that's a little clue for you. If you're outside and the weather is bad and your hair starts to stand up, maybe the hair on the back of your neck or your arms or the top of your head, that's a, an extreme danger sign. And this happened to a friend of mine a couple of years ago. There she is. She was uh, chasing a storm. This is my friend Jade. And her hair started to stand up on end. And she managed to catch a photo of it. Uh, luckily, there was no lightning strike that happened, but there was the, the potential for a lightning strike was very, very high. And when, when she showed me this picture, I freaked out. It's like, do you realize how much danger you were in in that moment? Because that's basically a lightning bolt trying to complete that electrical circuit through the top of her head. So there's a bit of a big, big clue for you if you're ever outdoors and that happens. Get indoors, get in a car, get inside a sturdy building. Uh, try to not be the tallest object around. So you've got that positive charge and that negative charge like a battery and Often you'll have that discharge go from cloud to cloud. You'll have that discharge of energy go from cloud to ground, like you mentioned, sometimes from the ground up to the clouds. And it can happen well, pretty much anywhere in a thunderstorm cloud. And there's times when I've seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of lightning bolts. And it's really amazing how much power there is in each of these bolts. This picture is from uh, New Mexico, which is it's kind of like a desert in New Mexico. It's very deserty, but they do get what we call the monsoon season there. And during monsoon season, you've got a lot of moisture that comes up from the Gulf of Mexico. It helps to feed these storms that happen in the desert. And then you get these beautiful displays of, of lightning and the beautiful branches. So each branch on the lightning bolt is a potential circuit that never happened. The bolt that makes it all the way to the ground, that's the, the actual completed circuit. So that charge will come down from the cloud. It'll pool in one little area, branch off. And all of this takes millionths of a second. It'll go a little further, branch off, trying to find that path of least resistance, trying to find the, the earth. And when it finally does, all of that built up energy goes flowing through that one channel that made the connection. And uh, it's just, super, super cool. And most of this happens so quickly that you can barely see it with the naked eye. But when you do long exposure photography, that's when you can actually see it. So a few facts about lightning. Uh, a single bolt of lightning can be up to 100 million volts of electricity and about 30,000 amps of power. So to put that in perspective, at home, if you're in North America, you've got 110 volts in the wall. If you're in Europe, it's 220 volts. And that, that amount of voltage, that, that can kill you. So imagine 100 million volts. So extremely powerful. 
And each bolt is so hot, it's actually five times hotter than the surface of the sun. So that is just un unbelievably hot, but only again for a fraction of a second. And even though these lightning bolts look like they're thick and wide, they're so bright because of all that power and that, that heat that um, you don't realize that the bolt is only about as thick as your finger. They're actually quite small, quite narrow. And thunder, of course, we associate with lightning. Thunder is the sound of lightning, but more specifically, it's the sound of the air around that lightning bolt exploding at tremendous speeds, faster than the speed of sound, creating a sonic boom, actually. And that sonic boom created by that exploding air is what creates the sound of thunder. And the farther away the thunder is, the more muffled it's going to sound. And if the lightning's very close, it'll be very loud and very bright sounding. You'll hear that crack as opposed to a low rumble. And the reason for that is as the sound travels through the atmosphere, the atmosphere actually absorbs some of that sound energy. And that mostly happens in the high frequencies. So a, a very close lightning bolt will, will be very sharp and bright sounding. And that distance of thunder will be a, a low, gentle rumbling sound. And it takes about five seconds for the sound to travel one mile or 1.6 kilometers. So you can have fun with this. You can be uh, in a storm and watch a flash of lightning and then count. For every five seconds that you count between when you saw the flash and heard the bang of the thunder, that is about a mile. So that tells you how far away the lightning is and that can you can use that to determine whether the storm is getting closer to you, getting farther away from you, that kind of thing. So there's a cute little, uh, a great little trick to uh, determine how far the lightning is from you. We have these things, what we call a flang, <laughs> where there's no difference between the flash and the bang. They happen simultaneously. And that's when the lightning is so close that there's no distance in between, no time in between. It's just in unbelievably close. And I've had lightning strike so close that I've, seen the sparks coming up off the ground and felt the heat on my face. So that can be pretty uh, intense to say the least. So where do we have, where do we get the most lightning? Well, in North America, you can see it happens in the South in places like Louisiana, Alabama, Florida is actually the lightning capital of North America. They get more lightning strikes per square mile there than anywhere else in North America. Um, but anywhere in the equatorial tropics regions is where you get a lot of these uh, lightning strikes. So down into Mexico, Central America, of course. But globally, worldwide, let's look at a global map here. We get quite a bit in North America, yes. But there's a few other hot spots. Look at Central Africa, particularly the Congo. They get a lot of lightning there. And then over in Asia, check it out. Places like uh, Southeast Asia, um, Singapore gets a lot of lightning. We've got a lot of lightning in the, the Amazon, in the Brazilian rainforest. Of course, with the rainforest, you get lots of thunder uh, because of all that rain. So of course, you're gonna get lots of lightning strikes. Um, in India, you can really see a defined line between the Southern part of uh, India where there's lightning strikes, but then it suddenly stops. Well, that's the Himalaya mountains. The lightning, the storms, the, the moisture in the storms, they go up into India but then they stop when they hit the Himalayas. So you can really see where that gigantic mountain range is affecting the weather. So that's really cool. But look over at northern part of southern of uh, South America. There's an area there that really has a lot of lightning. And that is the lightning capital of the world officially. And there's a place in Venezuela that I have been to uh, called the Catatumbo uh, river where the, the Catatumbo River meets Lake Maracaibo and they consider it the everlasting lightning storm and there is lightning almost every single night of the year on this particular lake. The geography there is just perfect. There's a, a, a ring of mountains that hold the moisture from the, um, from the ocean right there. It tends to funnel into where the lake is the conditions are just right most nights of the year for there to be a lightning storm. And ships have actually used it kind of like a lighthouse for navigating this, this particular area because there's always, almost always a thunderstorm there. And when I visited a few years ago uh, to film an episode of the Angry Planet TV show, we were down in the Southern part of the lake. So I can give you an idea of where it is. 
and we had so much lightning. It was crashing all around us. And of course, um, these storms are very powerful. You get a lot of rain, a lot of wind, lots of lightning, of course. And the buildings that you're in are not very sturdy. Uh, the, the villages on this lake are literally out on stilts. There's no roads. You have to take a boat to get to this area. And this, these little shacks with tin roofs are not very secure. And meanwhile, there's lightning crashing all around you and you do not feel very safe. Let's put it that way, because you just never know when one is going to hit really, really close, but it is so spectacular. And this particular village, uh, the name of the village was El Congo. Very basic. If you want to go here to see this everlasting lightning storm, I warn you now, it is a very basic place. And like I said, no roads, lots of mosquitoes. This is the perfect breeding ground for mosquitoes. So if you like bugs, or if you hate bugs, I mean, this is not the place for you. And also, just to give you an example, this is what the toilet was like. Basically, just a box that opened down into the lake. So <laughs> consider yourself warned. If you ever want to go here to see these beautiful storms, there are some sacrifices to be made and some challenges along the way. <laughs> but we won't dwell on that. <laughs> um, this is one of my favorite lightning photos I've ever taken. This was last year in Oklahoma. Usually when I'm trying to photograph lightning, it never happens where I've got my camera aimed, but here there were dozens and dozens and dozens of lightning bolts that all happened within a span of about maybe 10 minutes. So this is um, a stacked image, several photos stacked together to show this barrage of lightning. So this would have been billions of volts worth of electricity. And it's really hard to imagine in my mind how these clouds are able to create these incredible forces with so much power. And you don't even have to be in the rain or under the clouds to get struck by this lightning. These can be miles, miles long. And occasionally you get this, uh, this phenomenon called a bolt from the blue, where you can be under blue sky there might not even be a storm very close to you. It might be, you might be able to see it sort of in the distance, this big cloud, but lightning can branch an arc out of the storm and hit you even if you're under blue sky. But there has to be a storm nearby, of course, for that to happen. So it's a relatively rare phenomenon, but it does happen. And I, I got a nice picture of it uh, from Texas last year. So it's, uh, it's such a bizarre, bizarre phenomenon. And when lightning hits, certain types of sand, it creates glass because the lightning is so hot, remember five times hotter than the surface of the sun, it melts the glass and, or sorry, melts the sand and turns it into a type of glass. Now, not glass that you can really see through, but glass is basically made from melted sand. So these fulgurites, as they're called, can be found on some beaches where lightning has been striking. And I've got one here. I'm going to show you guys as soon as I'm done with the presentation. I have a fulgurite in my hand right now. So Jesse, don't let me forget to show everybody that because it's super, super cool. It's hollow like a straw. You can actually see where the, uh, the lightning channel vaporized the sand inside. So a little bit about lightning safety. So there's no safe place outdoors if there's lightning nearby. But these things can help reduce the risk of being struck by lightning. So avoid open fields, of course. Don't be on the top of a hill or top of a ridge or a mountain. People get killed uh, on mountains, climbing mountains when lightning comes in. Stay away from tall trees. Stay away from power poles, anything like that. Don't be, on, don't be in a boat out on the water. Don't be swimming. Don't be in the pool. Um, don't be in a tent. Indoors is the best place to be. If you can't be inside a sturdy house, be inside a car, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit, about uh, how cars protect you from lightning. Interestingly, don't be in the bathtub and don't take a shower during a lightning storm because lightning can hit the ground, that electricity can travel through the metal pipes into your house, through the water that you're taking a shower under, and you can be shocked by that. Same thing if you're on a landline telephone. People have been killed by lightning hitting the telephone lines, coming through their phone and zapping them in the side of the head. Of course, your cell phone can't do that, but if you have a landline, 
stay off your landline during a thunderstorm. So when is it safe? When should you go inside and when is it safe to go back out? Well, we've got this thing called the 30-30 rule. And it states that if you hear thunder within 30 seconds of seeing the lightning flash, you should go indoors. Now remember, it's five seconds for every mile or five seconds for every 1.6 kilometers. So this shows us that lightning can strike many, many kilometers or many miles away. So 30 seconds between the flash and the bang, that's when you should go inside and wait for at least 30 minutes after you've heard the last thunder. That's when it's safe to go back outside, to go back and play soccer or go out and do whatever it is you're doing outside. And this is the rule that most sports teams will follow. If, uh, if there's like a little league game, things like that, and they call it off because of uh, the threat of lightning, this is the sort of the guideline that they go by. Here's why you don't want to stand under a tree. Let's watch that again. <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna go back and talk a little bit about what happened in that video clip. So of course, the tall tree, the lightning hits the tall tree because it, it provided a path of, uh, of uh, least resistance for that electricity to, to pass through. A tree is more electrically, electrically conductive than the air. So the lightning wants to go through that tree more than it wants to go through the air. But what happens is when it hits the tree, the sap inside the tree immediately boils and explodes outwards. And you can see the tree bark all exploding out and the top of the tree comes crashing down. So if you're standing underneath that tree, you can get a shock from the lightning you can also get burned from the sap, plus you can have the top of the tree landing on you. Let's watch that one more time. I never get tired of that clip. <laughs> and this is an example of a Lichtenberg uh, scar. So this is someone who actually got struck by lightning and uh, you can see the actual pattern of the electricity. It's like a fractal pattern going over their skin. So certain things that can happen to you if you get struck by lightning, your heart can stop because it basically shocks your heart. So that's a one main cause of death from lightning. You can get burns, of course, from the heat. You can have all kinds of internal organ damage. Hearing damage is one of the most common things that happens when you're struck by lightning because the sound of thunder is so loud because you're getting hit by it that it can rupture your eardrums. But one of the more interesting things is these Lichtenberg uh, scars. And I've actually seen people who have uh, been struck by lightning who have these scars and they get tattoos. They, they actually get tattoos to emphasize it, to sort of show off that they survived this lightning strike. And you don't even have to take a direct hit. If you have a bolt that hits you in the head, your odds of survival are not very good. Most people that survive lightning strikes are ones that get hit indirectly. Like the lightning will hit a tree and then the lightning will then come out of the tree and hit you or hits the ground and travels through the ground and then goes up your leg. These indirect lightning strikes. But uh, it's really a fascinating pattern that happens on the human skin. I, I would never want this to happen to anybody. It's a horrible, horrible thing, but boy, it sure does look cool. So let's dispel a few myths about lightning. Lightning never strikes the same place twice. Eh, false, busted. The CN Tower that I showed you earlier, the tip of that CN Tower gets struck almost a hundred times every year. So lightning will absolutely sometimes hit the same place twice. Uh, there was a park ranger, Roy Sullivan. He holds the Guinness World Record for being struck by lightning the most times. He was struck seven times in his lifetime. Unbelievable and survived every single one of them. Look him up, really interesting dude. Uh, people talk about heat lightning in the summer where you see flashes of light along the horizon and say, oh, it's just caused because it's hot outside. Eh, no, false. Those are actual thunderstorms. There are people under those storms where it's raining on them, just like a regular thunderstorm, you just happen to be far enough away from it that you can see the flashes, but you can't hear the thunder because the atmosphere is absorbing all of the sound. So heat lightning is a bit of a myth. 
So sheet lightning, not heat lightning, but sheet lightning is when you see all just the flashes in the clouds, right? Well, those are actual bolts. You just can't see the bolts because they're obscured by the actual clouds themselves. And that's what most lightning bolts are. Most of them are up inside the clouds. So that electricity is discharging from one part of the cloud to another. And you're not seeing the, the, the actual bolts because it's obscured by the cloud itself. So it's not a different type of lightning. It's just because of where it is. And as we mentioned earlier, being in a car is pretty safe, but not because of the rubber tires. It actually has to do with the metal of the car. When the lightning strikes a car, that metal is a really good conductor of electricity, right? That's why wires in your house are made of metal. They're made of copper, right? So the metal is a really good conductor. The lightning will travel over the skin of your car and then discharge to ground. So as long as you're, you're not like standing on the ground with your car, with your hand on the car hood, that would probably end up killing you. But if you're inside the car, this uh, car actually acts as what we call it as a Faraday cage. And that metal protecting you will shield you from the lightning. And I've got a video here of a car getting struck by lightning. Watch this little white car and wham. The people inside the car, totally fine. But what happened was that electricity traveled through the car and ended up discharging from the bottom of the car into the ground. Now look at the asphalt. You can actually see a crater that's left behind if you look closely, like a pit that was caused by the lightning strike traveling through the car. Now the car might, might be okay or it might, uh, might have fried the electrics, uh, the electrical system, but you, the person inside the car, mainly like, no problem. It would it'd probably scare them, <laughs> certainly startle them. And you would not want to be in a convertible. But if you have metal over top of your head, then yeah, you're likely going to be just fine. So lightning gets even weirder. There are lightning phenomena that have only recently been documented. We have these things called red sprites. And they are these luminous discharges of electricity that happen way above the storm clouds. These are almost never, ever seen. And we're only just learning about these weird types of lightning. Uh, here's an example. Uh, this is from uh, a buddy of mine, Paul Smith, who is a really great uh, lightning photographer. And they look like these red jellyfish. You'll never see these if you are underneath the storm. You can only see them if you're like hundreds of miles away. So on the horizon, you can see the storm cloud. You can see a little bit of light from the regular lightning at the top of the cloud. But yet, towering above these thunderstorms are these giant jellyfish of electrical discharge that are almost reaching up into space. And these were not even documented until, they were never photographed until 1989. There have been reports of them, these transient luminous events. And um, some of the astronauts up in the International Space Station have even seen them because they're flying sort of above them and they can actually see these red sprites coming out of the tops of thunderstorms. So this totally fascinates me. I haven't had the opportunity to photograph these myself yet, but it is really high on my bucket list. And I've got a video here. Yeah, here's a video. So there you can see the regular sheet lightning happening inside the cloud. Boom, there's a sprite. We'll see it in slow motion, happens so fast. There's a little sprite there and then a big sprite in the middle of the screen, wait for it, whammo. It's like a giant magical jellyfish coming out of the top of the storm. Super, super cool. Almost impossible to see with the naked eye. You might be able to see it on a really dark night if the conditions are just right, if it's really clear, but super amazing. There's another a really good example where you see sort of like a higher resolution uh, version with these, these tentacles coming down. They're just so bizarre. And that's not all. There are other bizarre lightning phenomena as well. So we've got red sprites. We have things called blue jets. And these things called elves, which we know very, very little about. And these are really high up in the atmosphere. So there's still so much that we have to learn. And I've got an image of one of these gigantic jets here. There we go. Coming out of the top of that storm, we've got one of those blue jets. 
So yeah, it's just elves, jets, sprites. There's so much stuff going on there above the storms that we never knew was happening. It's this whole new field of research. And this gives you an idea of what's happening at different altitudes. So if you're down in a city on the ground, you, of course, you've got all these cloud to ground strikes. And uh, of course, the cloud is going to be obscuring your view of all these blue jets and sprites and elves that are happening. Well, the elves can be happening between 85 to 600 and almost 700 kilometers above the cloud, like way, way, way up there. So we can't we can't summon lightning like Thor, but we can create lightning in a lab with a thing called a Tesla coil, which is pretty cool. Um, I haven't built one of these myself yet, and I know they have one at the Science Center here in Toronto. And basically, it's a way of making man-made lightning on a much smaller scale. We're not talking about millions of volts here, but we're talking thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of volts of electricity. If you were to get uh, close to this thing and it were to zap you, it would, it would ruin your day. Uh, this would hurt quite a bit. They're very loud. And uh, there is one way of getting up close to these things and sort of simulate what it's like being struck by lightning. And that is to wear a special chainmail suit. It's basically a Faraday cage that you can wear. And Kind of like being in a car, if the car uh, gets struck by lightning, the metal of the, car, of the car protects you from the lightning. Well, there are actually suits that you can wear that'll allow you to get close to these Tesla coils. I haven't done this myself yet, but this is really high on uh, my list of things I wanna film to show people um, how lightning reacts and things like that. So this is magician uh, David Blaine. He did a whole big demonstration one time where he had four giant Tesla coils blasting him with hundreds of thousands of volts worth of electricity. And he's totally fine. If he were to take off that caged helmet though, then he'd have a, he'd have a, a real bad day. But yeah, really, really fascinating. But we can actually summon lightning. We have the ability to actually pull lightning from the clouds under just the right circumstances using rockets. There are a couple of universities. There was one in New Mexico and one in Florida that have uh, a research lab where they study lightning. And one of the things that they do is they wait for a storm to come overhead and they have a special meter that can detect how much electrical charge is building up in the atmosphere. So they can predict when a lightning strike is probably going to occur. And then they launch a rocket, a small rocket up into the cloud trailing a copper wire behind it that's attached to ground. And it actually triggers the lightning to hit the copper wire, bam, and come down to ground where they can measure how much power is in it. And I've got a video, check this out. Watch for the rocket going up and then you'll see the lightning bolt coming down. There goes the rocket, wham. How cool is that? Let's watch that a couple more times. There goes the rocket, you can see the smoke from the rocket. Lamo, lightning hitting the uh, the copper wire, and you can hear the different um, claps of thunder every time it flickers. Super, super cool. And the reason why lightning flickers like that is because all of the charge that's being drained out of the cloud. Uh, doesn't do it all at once. It does it in these pulses and we call those return strokes. So you can have lightning flickering a lot. That means there's lots of pulses of electricity coming down from the cloud to the ground. And notice there's no branches. Let's watch that again. It's a straight line almost, right? It zigzags a little bit, but you're not getting these branches of lightning like you would see on a normal lightning strike. And that's because that copper wire is providing such a good conductor of electricity that the lightning doesn't have any need to look anywhere else. It's not trying to find a pass to ground, it's found the expressway, right? This is like the, the interstate highway to, to completing that electrical circuit. So it, uh, it, it just loves that copper wire and goes straight down. Let's watch that one more time, it's so cool. Up goes the rocket, down comes the lightning. Amazing. 
Now, just a couple more things before we start taking questions. There are some other bizarre, weird ways that lightning can be formed, like in volcanoes. You can get lightning that actually occurs in the ash that is burped out by these volcanic eruptions. This is a photo I took in Indonesia at uh, Krakatoa volcano. And what happens is, similar to rubbing your feet together on a carpet to build up that electrical charge, you can have the different particles of ash rubbing together, billions and billions of them, and that creates this static electrical buildup, which then gets discharged as lightning bolts. So there's no storm here at all. It's just a cloud of volcanic ash in this volcanic eruption. And there's some really, really cool examples online. If you do a little bit of searching, just search for volcanic lightning and you'll see some really interesting images um, that happen. I've been chasing volcanoes now for close to 20 years and I've only been able to photograph it once. It's a pretty rare phenomenon. But not just storms, not just volcanoes. You can actually get lightning that forms in wildfires. So you've got a similar situation. You've got a forest fire that's burning. That heat is rising up. That heat then, um, the moisture and all that heat turns into a cloud, a pyrocumulus cloud. So wildfires, these forest fires can create their own weather. So the fire creates the storm. The storm then can sometimes create lightning and those lightning strikes can then spark more forest fires. So it becomes this vicious circle. And so you've got the fire creating this updraft, that warm air goes up where it cools, the moisture in that air turns into clouds, the clouds then have ice crystals and little bits of smoke that rub together that create that friction, just like the static buildup when you rub your feet on the carpet or, or pet your cat. And then blammo, you get lightning that can form out of a uh, wildfire. So there's a few examples of some really weird, weird, weird lightning stuff. Um, I've got lots more uh, pictures and, and videos and stuff. You can just check out all my social media. And I want to show you this fulgurite that I've got here. Let me turn my screen sharing off. Here we go. So here is a fulgurite. That is glass created by lightning striking. And you can see it is totally hollow. Let me just stick something through here. There we go, totally hollow. So the electricity that flowed through the sand here was so powerful that all the sand in the middle got vaporized and the stuff on the outside was just hot enough to turn it into glass. Super, super, super cool. Super. So if you're on a beach or in the desert, if you see a cactus or a tree that's got a burn mark down the side where lightning has struck the tree, Go take a look around the roots and dig around a little bit. You might find one of these. George, that was like one of the most beautiful, coolest presentations you've ever had. Um, and and the, like the YouTube groups just kept going up. It's like everyone kept sharing it with their friends, which is awesome. So we're going to dive in with Q&A, guys, uh, for about the next 10 minutes or so. For groups on YouTube, let me know where you're joining from. Share some cool questions for our live groups. I'll come to you in just a second. But I love this question from Emily in St. Louis. She's six years old. She wants to know, can the energy from lightning be captured and used as an energy source, George? No, I wish it could, because that would be a really great source of energy. As I showed, we can, under just the right conditions, cause a lightning bolt to hit a specific spot, but it's not reliable enough, and there's no way of capturing that energy. We can only trigger that energy. So yeah, we, we don't have that capability and I don't see the technology to be able to do that being developed anytime soon. There are much easier ways, solar power, wind power, things like that. Yeah. But it would be super cool. Would be super cool. All right. <laughs> Let's go to Ms. Grandel's class. Uh, joining us in Morrison, Colorado. Ms. Grandel, if you have a question for us, uh, come on up, go for it. Can you hear me? Yep. Awesome. Okay, so they had a bunch of questions, uh, but I think the, the more pressing question was what happened to the rocket? They were very curious about <laughs> what happened to that rocket. Oh, that rocket is long gone. <laughs> it would have been completely destroyed by that lightning hit. I'm sure. Um, but another more scientific related question um, that one of them had emailed me while they were watching was, um, with ball lightning and other cloud to cloud types of lightning, is there still electron transfers to the ground below it? Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So 
when when lightning impacts something, you get uh, what we call a voltage gradient. So the voltage is the highest right where the lightning strikes, but then it goes into the ground and you get that transfer of electrons that happens to spread out and it eventually dissipates. But the closer you are to that lightning strike, the more power there is. And there are examples of there being like soccer teams out on a field, unfortunately, where the lightning has hit somewhere on the field and every single player went down because that voltage spread out across a vast area, traveled up one leg, down the other, and across their heart. And there are lots of examples of entire herds of cattle being killed because a lightning strike hit very close and that voltage spread out across them, yeah, through the ground. Great questions, uh, Ms. Grandel. Thank you so much. Um, let's go to Ms. Christensen's class in Lake Elmo, Minnesota. If you have some questions, come on up and... All right. Thank you so much for that great presentation. Um, so one of the questions that came up was with um, climate change and everything, are you noticing a, an increase in lightning strikes or is it just more because we're kind of, we're more spread out around the world? Right, we don't know exactly yet, but there's some really cool technology that's out there that's gathering the data to help us answer that question. So there are satellites that are orbiting above planet Earth that can detect these flashes of light and actually count the number of lightning strikes. So we can't determine if something is changing unless we know what it is now, right? So these satellites are really helping, but also another way that we can detect lightning is through something called spherics. So when a lightning uh, strike happens, it creates a lot of light, it creates heat, it creates sound, but it also creates radio waves. And if you're listening on the AM dial, if, you, if you're in your car and there's a, a thunderstorm nearby, go to the AM radio and you'll hear, you'll hear all these sounds. And those are the radio waves that are created by the lightning strikes. You can hear them on your AM radio, but we have detectors that can actually figure out, um, you, know, you know, determine the number of lightning strikes based on these radio waves that they create. Super cool. Uh, actually, Ms. Christensen, if you have a second question, go for it. We got two from Ms. Grinnell, so you can have a second. Go for it. Yeah, actually, this is more of an experiential question for you. So what what have you, what do you do if you're out? Um, I know I read all the, the NOAA um, suggestions, but what, have you, what do you do um, to stay safe when you're out in the field? And yeah, in so what I'll try to do is be as safe as practically possible. So sometimes what I'll do is I'll set up my tripod on a window mount in my car so that I can be in the car and I can clamp my camera to the actual window. Uh, so that really helps, that, that helps keep me safe. Sometimes I'll set up my tripod outside, maybe in a garage or under some kind of canopy. So if lightning does hit nearby, it'll likely not come near me, it'll go somewhere else. Uh, so there's things like that. And when, when it gets too close, psh, we just, roll up the windows, get in the car, and just ride it out. There's no photo worth dying for. Nope. Fantastic. And I'm glad we got that message in, too. Um, before I come to Patricia and Zeke and Joe, I'm just going to go to a few quick YouTube questions from teachers. So Mr. Rutledge wanted to know, this winter we had some, some thunder lightning during winter storms. This seems to be happening. What? Do you go? What, George? <laughs> You're so fucked. <laughs> um, thunder snow. It's so cool. Thunder snow. So this seems to be happening more. Is there a reason for that? Do we understand that? Anything about thunder snow? <laughs> yeah. So um, thunder snow, it's, it's uh, basically lightning that happens in a thunderstorm. And here in Southern Ontario, where I live, I've experienced it numerous times usually in the strongest of, of uh, snowstorms and quite often in the lake effect snowstorms. So that's when the warm, moist air comes off of the Great Lakes, gets carried up, it freezes, turns into these uh, bands of snow. But sometimes the ice crystals are very vigorous. There's a lot of convection. It's really strong and powerful. And there can be enough friction, even in the winter time in these storms, to create lightning. So it's a really cool phenomenon. But, um, pardon the pun, because it's in snow. Um, the thing with thunder snow is, you'll see a flash and you'll hear the thunder, but you'll almost never see the bolt because there's snow coming down, right? And it's always gonna be obscured. But when you're out there, I, I remember very fondly, my favorite time experiencing thunder snow was, 
I'm trying to remember what year it was. It was the year when we had so much snow in Toronto that they had to call in the army. I was riding my bicycle through that snowstorm and there was thunder snow going on all around me and I, my hair was frozen, my eyelashes were frozen and it was just this really cool experience. And it's not so much that we're seeing more of that right now. I think people are becoming more aware of this and uh, we've just happened to have a, quite a few of these thunder snow events that have happened in populated areas in, in the recent years. It's a really cool phenomenon. It's not super dangerous because it's not really uh, common, but it's, it's awesome. I usually experience it about once every year or so. Is it safe to say, George, that you are amped up about thunder snow? Oh, all the electrical <laughs> puns on this on this chat. <laughs> all right, uh, our question by uh, on Miss Braca, and she wanted to know uh, what's the closest you've been to a lightning strike. So you mentioned this at the beginning of your talk, but like, yeah. where was this? How close was it? What's going on? Yeah, I've had lightning strike right across the street from me, hitting a cell phone tower. Um, I've been in my car and had lightning hit so close that I felt it through the window, like through the glass, I could feel the heat. So yeah, pr pretty close. I have some colleagues that have been in cars that have been struck by lightning. Uh, that's super, super scary. Even it's relatively safe for them, but it's certainly frightening to have that happen and it'll do a lot of damage to your car, but uh, that hasn't happened to me yet, touch wood. <laughs> Not that I'm superstitious, but close enough to, to scare you, yeah. scare me a lot, yeah. All right, one more YouTube question before we go back to our two live groups. Uh, so from a student in Ms. Huxley's class in Brampton, and thanks for joining in in like so many sessions this month. I really appreciate you guys keep coming in. Um, is there anything hotter than a lightning bolt? You said hotter than the surface of the sun. Is there anything hotter? Yes, so the surface of the sun is actually cooler than the interior of the sun. So yeah, there are things that are much, much hotter than that. Is, I mean, as a volcano guy, is lava hotter than a lightning strike or? What? Oh, no, no, no. Lightning strike is much hotter than, uh, than lava. Yeah, so we're looking at like 50,000 degrees hot for a lightning strike, whereas lava could be max maybe 1,800, 2,000 degrees. So yeah, right. lightning much hotter than lava. Not even but dangerous. Only for, yeah, only we're for gonna, a fraction of a second though. You know what, we're going to erase your volcano pass sessions, but it's not even that exciting anymore. <laughs> Uh, George, all right, let's go to Patricia. If you have a question uh, joining us, come on up. Um, okay, so I'm just wondering how many, um, like in one day, how many bolts of lightning have you seen? Yeah. Wow, in, in a single day, so hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Uh, I, I, impossible to count. There are times when I have spent hours and hours chasing multiple storms, usually when I'm chasing tornadoes, and we've noticed a really interesting, you've brought up an interesting thing is that sometimes you get uh, certain storms that really produce a lot more lightning than others. And one thing that we've noticed is that if a storm is rotating and starts producing a lot of lightning, when we detect that rotation, it's likely it's gonna produce a tornado. So one of the hints or one of the clues that we have learned is to watch how much lightning a storm is producing to give us an idea of whether or not it may produce a tornado. And I've seen storms that have just produced, like every, every two seconds, you've got a bolt coming down. It, unbelievable, yeah. Cool. All right, and then one Shocking. last question from Zeke and Joe uh, joining us. Uh, if you guys have one, come on up. How long have you been in a storm for one day? Uh, well, I've been in hurricanes that have lasted many days. So those sort of count and you get lightning in hurricanes as well. Not a lot of lightning, but you do get lightning in some of the outer bands of the hurricanes and also in the eye wall, the strongest winds of the hurricane, you'll get lightning in there as well. And I remember being in hurricane, I was in Galveston, Texas for hurricane, I can't remember which one, Ike, Hurricane Ike. And it was nighttime and we got into the calm eye of the storm. And I could look across and I could see flashes of lightning in the opposite side of the eye wall that was coming towards me. And that was super, super cool. Um, some hurricanes I've been in for three days. Hurricane Francis was three days of being in the storm. We were sure. tired and soaking wet. This is amazing. We've had so many questions come in on YouTube. It's ridiculous. I know all our live groups could probably have 20 more questions too. Uh, we are getting near the end of the session. So I want to ask if kids want to learn more about lightning, thunder, big storms, all the work that you've done, where can we send them? 
Uh, well, um, uh, if you go to furiousearth.com, that's my personal website. There's all kinds of information on there. But uh, just let your search engine do the walking. There's all kinds of resources out there about uh, lightning, about uh, going to YouTube. There's countless really cool lightning videos on YouTube, ones that explain in more detail about some of the things that I was talking about and just some really cool, uh, just randomly captured lightning strikes, like, like the car getting struck or the tree getting struck. There's so much of that stuff, really cool. Fantastic. Well, thank you so, so much again for such an awesome presentation. Again, some of the coolest imagery we've ever had in one of these programs. Uh, as you know, George, at the end of every program, I'm going to mute everyone's microphones to Ms. Christensen, Ms. Grandel, Patricia, and Zeke and Joe. If you guys could join me in saying a big thank you to George for joining us today. You are all now demuted. Go for it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, guys, so much for joining in today. We really appreciate you tuning in on YouTube and, and live. It's so awesome getting to share cool stories like this. George, thank you so much for joining us once again. And uh, pleasure, Jesse. Thanks so much. See you again soon. For everyone on live and on YouTube, go check out George's other videos on our channel from Nika Crystal Cave in Mexico to volcanoes to hurricanes, tornadoes, and more. We have covered some of the coolest topics in the world. I have no more lightning puns, and I'm sorry for that to wrap us up, but uh, I'll just say bye. <laughs> Hope to see you all soon. I'm yeah. shocked. I, I got a bolt. I'll see you.